Kripke. Welcome to the Democracy Matters uh, series here at the McDonald Laurier Institute. I'm uh, very happy and honored to be joined today by Eli Lake, one of America's finest journalists uh, covering national security issues, foreign policy, um, and a true friend and ally to democracy movements around the world. Uh, Eli uh, has been writing uh, long pieces for Commentary Magazine and um, many other periodicals. He is a senior fellow at the Clement Center at the University of Texas at Austin. Eli, thank you so much for giving us your time, especially now when you're in high demand given all that's happening in Ukraine. Um, let well, me just- Miriam, I mean, you're one of my heroes, so of course. So kind. Um, we appreciate your time. How did we get here, Eli? How did uh, how did we get here such that a, a major world power has invaded another country? Well, how do you a, see it? It's a great question. And um, I think we should state first and foremost that Putin is entirely responsible for the war he has just unleashed. He is the aggressor. Um, it's important, and I think we should have a conversation about the failure of the West and America to stop him and to understand who Putin was and how to deal with him, but it should not bleed into the idea that somehow uh, the failures of Biden's diplomacy to deter Putin makes Biden somewhat responsible for what is happening. That is entirely on Vladimir Putin. Mm -hmm. And the world, I think, is seeing that right now. And my hope is that we recognize finally the world has changed, that we can no longer have an approach to Russia that is sometimes called selective engagement, where we recognize that we compete or we're adversaries on certain issues, but we can cooperate on things like the Iran nuclear deal or climate change, um, there can be no accommodation for Putin's regime. And the work now is diplomatically, economically, culturally, politically, to begin to treat Russia like the pariah it is. I think that uh, it, the way to understand Russia is that it is a larger nuclear Saddam, Saddam's Iraq or, 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 or Iran for that matter. It is a rogue state. And as such, um, it should be undermined, contained, uh, and thwarted, period. And so mm -hmm. my hope is that it's more than simply, you know, sanctions, which are complicated, especially because they can affect the Russian people who I don't think really should be blamed. This is the decision of their leadership. But, um, and the focus should really be on Putin's inner circle, the oligarchs whose billions are comprised of the stolen wealth of the Russian people, um, their families, their children should be kicked out of universities. I think that the slots that Ru the children of Russian oligarchs now have in Western schools should be reserved for the children of Russian dissidents and Russian activists. I would do the same with Iran and frankly, China. Yeah. Yeah. And I do think that we need to start having serious discussions about uh, changing the architecture of international security. I'm not mm -hmm. entirely sure. I mean, it makes no sense to me now that the UN Security Council has Russia presiding as a permanent member with veto power. My view is let's create an alternative to the UN Security Council. Let's, yeah. let's create an inter alternative to Interpol. Let's create an yeah. alternative. And, and the idea is to exclude Russia and probably China too. Um, and Iran. And, and I mean, we, we, we can go through the list, but the two biggies, we, we have to deal with the fact that we're living in a world where there are two great nuclear armed powers that will not cooperate with us, that are our enemies, that are a danger to the world and their neighbors. And they cannot be appeased they have to be contained. They have to be thwarted again. Yeah. And I would like to get back to um, the kind of aggressive uh, political approach. Doesn't necessarily have to be the U.S. president, although he should he should sort of understand his role, you know, in terms of symbolism. But we should we should make a much higher priority supporting 
uh, Alexei Navalny and his movement in Russia. Yeah. And, um, you know, I mean, the goal is that, you know, we don't we don't want to live in a world with Vladimir Putin. Yeah. So that's the that's the long haul strategic answer. In the short term, do you think that those kinds of moves like the the strategic sanctioning, uh, the isolating of of Vladimir Putin, uh, making sure that he and China and Iran understand that that we understand that they're all working together in the short term? Do you think it's going to stop him from basically taking over another country? Well, clearly that it isn't. I mean, we, we sadly, what we've seen uh, in the last, I guess, twelve hours, is what we've been war- we we've been warning about for the last month, which is that his goal is to take over all of Ukraine. He's attacking Kiev. We we should expect that there will be attempts to try to install a kind of puppet government. Mm-hmm. I hope that this creates the conditions for an insurgency. I don't think the Ukrainian people want to live under the boot of Russia. Of course, the United States should support that insurgency, not just the United States, the entire Western world should support that insurgency. Diplomatically, no country that is in the sort of free world. And the free world is not just a concept. I mean, I think the free world needs to, we need to understand what the free world is now. The free world is the, 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 the markets, the cultural institutions, the political institutions of the, the part of the world that is most desirable to live in. So mm-hmm. we have to use that kind of power that if you're a very gifted physicist in Iran or China, do you want to live in a country where at any given moment the security services can take away all of your money and detain you and torture you? Of course not. You want yeah. to live in San Francisco. You want to live in London. Right. So we need to understand that power that we have and we need to start using it. And that means that we have to start excluding, um, you know, the apparatus and the people who are the elites of regimes that uh, are undermining global security. Yeah. But we also have to build up our military and we have to be able to deter mm-hmm. militarily mm-hmm. in the future. We were not in a position to do that, I think, in Ukraine. Um, Part of that is for political reasons. We're very divided in the United States right now. Europe, Europe is dependent on Russian oil, so that yeah, uh, energy. So we need to we need to work to make Europe energy dependent. It's a huge long list of things that we need to be doing. Yeah, and we need to be doing it rapidly because right. we are up against the clock, as it were. Yeah. Um, and Putin is betting that the Europeans will not want to endure a cold winter without Russian gas and that there won't be alternatives and that this will spike the price of energy. They, uh, the former president Medvedev said that on Twitter a few days ago, uh, you know, the mask is slipping all over the place as it were. And so we need to, we need to be kind of countering that. And that so, so in some ways, things that normally we don't think about in terms of hard power geopolitics, uh, like, the anti-fracking agenda in the United States and the and the sort of concern that the efforts for for noble reasons to uh, come up with alternative energies and to fight climate change, um, but those have an effect that strengthens Putin's hand. So for the yeah. time being, it doesn't have to be permanent. We need to we need to get back to uh, kind of American energy independence, but also surplus so that we can we can backstop Europe. We need to support Israel's pipeline to Europe mm-hmm. um, and obviously make it so that Russian pipelines into Europe are never, the new one is not completed. Yeah. Um, so there's a long list of things that we have to do to make ourselves resilient, but we need to begin to understand that the choice, we're not in a position where we can like sort of wait Vladimir Putin has made this choice. He's he has made it. He has demonstrated who he is. Uh, I think you and I would argue that we've we've known who Vladimir Putin is now for a very long time, and we should not have waited this long. But here we are, and we can mm-hmm. quibble about the past and everything else. But it's not. It's we have to start thinking kind of strategically and in a serious way. Mm-hmm. And you know, we have to we focus on this kind of resilience. How much of the battle is an internal one to convince ourselves of the of the role that we as a as a country, um, the United States, 
and the rest of the free world need to have again on the on the global stage. There's a real reluctance. There's even a, a real spirit of isolationism on both sides of the political spectrum. I think really in every every Western country that I can think of. And how much of it is that? And also, uh, you know, alongside that concern, do you worry that taking on that more aggressive posture, uh, which is also a more principled posture um, about democracy and human rights, do you worry that that will push the, the big three troublemakers, uh, China, Russia, Iran, closer together? Well, anymore. they already are going to be closer together. Yeah. We just have to accept that there's there's going to be some collaboration. It'll be difficult. I mean, Russian and Iranians have been cooperating in Syria. And there is tension there because of the history between those two countries. Because, uh, and, and so, ideally, I mean, it would be nice if we could sort of, there was some Kissingerian play that pitted their Chinese against the Russians. And that would be nice, but we don't have that choice right now because, yeah. you know, Putin is, is making war on the doors and in Europe. I mean, this is, you know, again, ideally, I would, I would like it if Putin was contained and wasn't aggressive. I would like it. But they and the Russians and the Chinese have already signed some mutual pacts. There are things that can be done to kind of try to maybe at times on the margins exacerbate and get them sort of against each other. And by the way, I mean, you're talking about three regimes that are, you know, I guess the kind of global equivalent of, you know, rabid dogs. Yeah. So they will turn on each other. I mean, this is, you know, every few years to use a kind of a, maybe an inept analogy here, but, you know, every 15 or 20 years or so, there would be major wars among the five families in the New York mafia. Um, mm. That's the way we should look. I mean, I'm, I'm, but they're going to, they, we're, they understand that the example of, uh, you know, free democratic countries, and I'm not arguing that we don't have flaws right now, and that there are many things that I'm concerned about in the United States and trends, illiberal trends in the United States that are also threats to, you know, but I'm saying that overall, the, the Russians yeah. cannot abide by uh, successive elections and prosperity and freedom in Ukraine, because the Russian people will see that and under, and ask themselves quite logically, why can't we have that for ourselves? Right. And that's really what's, I think, motivating Putin, plus his own delusions of restoring, you know, not even the Soviet Union, but really the Romanov dynasty. I mean, this is somebody who, if you looked at his insane speech from Monday, you know, he yeah. was he, he was he sounded like a czar. Uh, and that's, yeah. you know, and that's and that's and this is this is by the way, we we've known that this is how Putin feels. He told us this in 2008 at the Munich Security Conference. He's told us this with his actions in Georgia. He's told us this with his actions since 2014 in Ukraine. He's, he, he's made it abundantly clear that he is interested in undermining the sort of international security architecture. And so yeah. with that in mind, we have to then change what has been the Western assumption since the end of the Cold War, which is that it was in America's interest and in the world's interest to enmesh Russia in that international system. What we have right. to recognize is that Russia is a cancer to that international system and therefore must be expunged from that international yes. system. It's a very simple concept. And I mean it from everything. I think the UN Security Council at this point, is a, it's, it's, been in, it's been feckless for a very long time, but it is a joke. That the, yeah. that the country presiding over the UN Security Council at a moment when Russia is invading Ukraine with no provocation on, a, on just a kind of farrago of lies yeah. is presiding over the UN Security Council. What are we even talking about? So right. the position has to be that the UN Security Council has zero legitimacy so long mm -hmm. as Russia is on it. And if mm -hmm. Other countries, and I'm sure that Russia will probably, that China will support Russia in this regard. If other countries want to say, well, that's gone too far, then the United States has to build a sort of parallel or shadow UN Security Council that excludes Russia. And for that yeah. matter, China too. But yeah. at this point, we're really seeing that the international system is sort of framed. This is a turning, it's a hinge moment. And we have to seize that and in, in a sense, overreact. Yes. Not, not militarily. I mean, I don't, because there is a real risk of nuclear war and that 
is a risk that we'd like to avoid. It doesn't mean cut off entirely all diplomatic contact with Russia. We should still have arms control agreements where we can. And Russians, by the way, also want arms control agreements with the United States, particularly on the nuclear file. But everything else, forget it. And yeah. how much do you worry about the delusional aspect of, of Vladimir Putin? I mean, um, is he calculating and rational or is he really something to be feared because he's not he's not OK in the head? Um, you know, it's hard to say. I do think that there is a kind of rationality to what he's doing, which is to say that um he has not provided Russians with a standard of living that matches yeah. the West. Yeah. But uh, discussing, you know, Kiev and Rus and the history of the Ukrainian uh, and Russian peoples and how Ukraine is really part of Russia and everything like that, and restoring Russia to its past glory, he is providing for a, a significant chunk of the Russian population. I don't know if it's a majority. Uh, a, a kind of sense of existential purpose. And that's important. Right. Uh, so, you know, and it's, you know, when, when, an, when great American presidents talk about the demands of uh, Americans to support democracy and, and freedom abroad, I mean, it's a similar kind of thing, except that, you know, our national ethos is one uh, where the world lives in freedom and prosperity, and Russia's national ethos is where the, or at least its 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 neighborhood lives under, uh, you know, it's the the tyranny of Moscow. So, yeah. Um, so, how, Brett Stevens has talked about this. I think um, you and others have talked about this. That it comes down to uh, our national security posture, our our weakness, in my opinion, right now it comes back to. Uh, a lack of self-belief, a lack of self-confidence, um, uh, losing that sense of what America has always been in terms of um, its own values domestically, its own unity domestically, and then it and then its posture on the world stage as leader of the free world. To get that back, what do you think are the biggest obstacles, and and what do you think Biden in particular needs to be doing? Well, I, I don't have a lot of faith in. Joe Biden at this moment. But at the, you know, first of all, you know, Biden made a decision early on uh, to take out, take off the table US military involvement. So the US military will not be defending Ukraine. He said that that great powers cannot bluff. And uh, I'm not entirely sure he was wrong because I don't think it would have been realistic. And I think maybe that Putin would have seen through it and we would have been more humiliated. But he did also promise. Mm. Kind of like we were in Syria, right? The red line. Yes, right. So that was bad. But he also promised, you know, crippling sanctions like you've never seen. And I was heartened uh, earlier this week when I saw the first tranche of it. I understand, I can, I'm not saying I agree with it, but I understand the logic of, well, we, we're not imposing it. We want it to be a, a credible threat. And so we want to give Putin an, an off ramp. That was their approach. Um, the danger of that approach is that now that he's done it, we're still talking about relentless diplomacy. We still, we, I just saw yesterday an interview with John Kerry in which he said, I really hope that none of this will affect Russia's cooperation on climate change. Is it, what's, what's wrong with you people? Um, so he's done there's it. Some delusion. There's some delusions on our side too. <laughs> Absolutely. There's delusion on our side. So, so he's done it. So we have to stop talking about relentless diplomacy. We have to understand that Putin has made his choice and we have to make it clear. And it's tiff. It's very tricky in the U S political system because we have elections. We have to make it clear that this is like a new day. It's a new era. There is no going back to the times when F the last four presidents Bill Clinton tried to accommodate things with Putin. George W. Bush did. And by the end of his presidency, he was so burned with the invasion of Georgia. Of course, Barack Obama had the famous reset. And then, of course, in 2014, he was burned with uh, Crimea. Trump tried his best, although his policies were much tougher than his rhetoric. But Trump, Trump tried to reset things with Putin. And guess what? Even Joe Biden, who campaigned as a Russia gating, you know, Trump is a Russian asset, all this other crap. He 
pursued a reset with Putin for almost the entire first year of his presidency. Remember, he lifted uh, or he he stopped enforcing the sanctions on Nord Stream 2, the pipeline between yeah. Russia and Germany. He had a major summit with Putin in which he did not impose sanctions for the colonial pipeline hack instead. And by the way, as a sweetener to Putin, when there were 100,000 forces doing military exercises on Ukraine's border back in over the summer, mm -hmm. he suspended military aid to Ukraine as a way of, you know, getting the meeting. So this is mm -hmm. what Biden did. He also pursued this kind of reset. And so there has to be, and well, only time will tell, that there will be no more resets. This is now the permanent reality for Russia so long as Putin is in charge that they will be a pariah. Get used to being treated like North Korea. That has to happen. And it's got to be on multiple levels. And I think we have to then, we, we should also start pressuring our tech companies, for example, yeah. to not go along with Russian law and erase the Navalny movement from the Russian internet, but to amplify the Navalny movement on the Russian internet and maybe to do things to screw up the Russia's own propaganda to its own people. I'm saying that there have to be very creative. We have yeah. a lot of power in the world because people desire to live here. People yeah. want our technology. People want our we, wealth. We have, want our we have the financial. We have the financial leverage because Putin's uh, wealth, yeah. his oligarchs' wealth, is uh, in London and other places, and and their children are 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 living in in. in Canada, United States, the UK, all the good places. Uh, it's going to take some time and it's going to take concentration, sustained levels of concentration, Absolutely. which the polarity. Uh, is and by the way, I would do this in one fell swoop because I think you're right yeah. that the, the, the dirt bags will align with one another because they're, they, they see themselves that they're, 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 that they understand that we're their enemy. So we should do it for Iran and China too yeah. and prepare, but we have to do it carefully, Miriam. What I mean is that we need to make sure that each one of these steps that I'm talking about, whether it's diplomatic, economic, political, whatever it is, they have we have to be prepared for that. So mm -hmm. that means that if at this point we can't fill um, because we haven't really prepared the energy needs of Europe, then as much as I would I want there to be as heavy a sanctions as possible on Russia, we, can, we have to be in a position where we can fulfill the to European energy needs. Yeah. And by the way, Europeans should be thinking this way too. Germany needs to reverse its ridiculous ban on nuclear power. Um, but we need to we, we need to be prepared to do this so that, so when it's coming. So I think we should be committing to trying to get Iranian and Russian oil off the market or to to make sure that the a large most of the, the free world is not purchasing that. Yeah. However, we shouldn't do just rush in kind of head first. We should be preparing to kind of meet those needs and talking to our allies like Saudi Arabia yeah. and other oil producing states and making sure that we have an ability to sort of fill that need without their resources. We need separation right. and that might take time, but that that is more important to me than, you know, what we're about to do now. Now, what we can do in the moment is really begin to go after all of the dirty Russian money that's in yeah. Europe and in the West. Uh, and that I'm, I'm heartened to see that the United Kingdom has started doing that. There are more that needs to be done. Yeah. Uh, and as you that's said, almost a, that's them. almost a war in itself. It's going to take, you know, sustained yes. resources to fight that, get that money out of. Uh, yeah. But I'll tell you something uh, else that needs to happen. Next week, we are told yeah. there's a chance we'll see an announcement of uh, a far even crappier Iran nuclear deal, even weaker than the one that was signed yeah. in 2015. Okay, that's ridiculous. The Russians probably were the ones who behind the scenes brokered that sure. thing. We should make it very clear. We don't want to be seen in the same podium as a Russian delegation. That's crazy. We and we're handing, we're about to hand billions of dollars again, essentially to that block of nations that that you have said are really against us and, and united together. Yeah, so we're as, as, dirt bags. as we talk about, you know, uh, confronting and 
um, pressuring Putin, we're going to be handing uh, the Iranian Iran's regime billions of dollars, which you know, as it used in Syria to fight alongside Putin, it can it can hand over at least some of that over to Putin to to fight uh, Ukraine. I'm and sure the Chinese will probably be happy helping. to buy Russian sovereign debt. We should expect that, right? But this is the point, which is that there is still a price that's paid because if you are a, a Russian billionaire, do you want to? You, you want to go to Champs Elysees. You want to you want to go to New York. You want to go to San Francisco, and um, that's no longer available to you. You want to send your kids to Western universities because those are the best universities, and that is no longer available to you. You can no is longer. Is that already do. the case? I mean, are they really being? Are they really sending people home and? And closing accounts. I mean, how do you know? Do you, how, how are you seeing it? Well, we just saw the announcement over the weekend, I think, of the first tranche of that. But I would hope that now that it's been clear that that he, they're going for Kiev, now we have to, to finish the job. And that's right. going to be very difficult. Again, that will take some planning. So mm. I will have, even though, again, we need to respond in the moment. And I'm hoping these things. But the, the, the important thing is here is that if we don't do it all at once, that we have made a strategic decision. This is the direction that we're going in. So it might be six months from now because the you know the British might need six months to kind of get their banking or whatever in order. But we have to. The decision has to now be made. Yeah, that's the most important thing. Yeah. That and and you know again the energy sanctions might not come in for another year, but they got to come because yeah. uh, you know we got to make sure that we're prepared for that. So in the past, um, I, re I always remember a conversation that you and I had where you you kind of warned me about how these broad-based sanctions on Iran long-term um, really don't help the movement for democracy. Um, long-term, we need to see these countries, Iran, Russia, China, all tyrannies, frankly, uh, turn to democracy for there to be real security in the democratic world. I think you probably share that view. So to what extent are these sanctions counterproductive or do you see that the sanctions, um, you know, I think in the conversation you and I had, I was of the opinion that the sanctions aren't really having a direct effect one way or the other, because when the JCPOA was in effect, people in Iran rose up in over 100 cities and, and have continued to have those nationwide protests. And then uh, under maximum pressure, they did they did so also. So it was almost as though um, sanctions were not the, the key variable um, as to whether the people are going to rise up against the regime or not, in great part because the regime is corrupt. And whether it has a little bit of money or a lot of money, it's still really corrupt. And the people aren't benefiting from uh, the trade or the selling of oil, really, when it comes to Russia and China. So uh, uh, Russia and Iran. Well, um, yeah, I mean, I, I want to. Yeah. what? You, so this is how I would I would talk about it in terms of um, sanctions are effective in depriving uh, tyrants of capital and money yes. that they yes. use to support terrorists and invasions and other things which are a threat to uh the united states and its allies the logic behind the iranian sanctions was that this was pressure to get iran to negotiate uh limits on its nuclear program yeah uh because the obama team was inept they negotiated a very weak deal and the uh iranians were able to keep their infrastructure and uh, the limits on uranium enrichment, at least, expired over time. Uh, so that is the logic of those crippling sanctions on Iran. The logic of crippling sanctions on Putin is as a punishment because it will make it harder for him to govern. His country will be poorer. But we should not con conflate these sanctions as effective tools in any way in terms of helping democracy movements in these countries, which we want to succeed. Mm -hmm. And we should, but more importantly, we should just abandon the idea that we're going to either cajole or pressure or entice 
yeah. uh, you know, blood-soaked tyrants like Xi, Putin, or Khamenei to change to to fundamentally open up their societies and allow their people the kinds of freedom that we 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 often take for granted in the West. So, yeah. the, so the logic of these sanctions that if we're going to use this to change your behavior in some way, even on the nuclear front, which didn't deal with political realities in Iran, was short-sighted because, of course, the Iranians understand that you know they know they're a bunch of fanatic criminals. They know that, and they know their people despise them, and mm -hmm. they understand that nuclear weapons are going to be and that and that their aggression is in some ways an insurance policy for their rule along with their brutal domestic repression ditto for 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 putin and ditto for china so what we need to understand is that you know maybe some there are cases where these kinds of punishing population centric sanctions are are valuable because they will deprive the bad guys of revenue but they are no substitute. They have nothing to do with a path to a democratic transition. But we, we have to understand about the democratic transition is that that is never going to happen because one day Putin wakes up and says, you know what, maybe I am the bad guy. Sure. It's never going to happen. The tyrant will always try to cling to power. The way sure. that it happens is that you convince enough people around the tyrant that it's better for them to side with the democracy movement and the people than the dictator. Yeah. And that is going to be specific, the, the conditions for that. There's no magic formula that's going to have to, that is up to the people in Russia, China, and Iran. More important, so we have to understand that when these tyrannies fall, and we hope they do, that they will not fall because of, you know, the magnanimity or the, you know, the grace of the leader. They will fall because the people pushed the leader out. And, okay. So just, yeah. just going back a little bit again. So the, the, the kind of sanctions that, that Iran, that were imposed on Iran during maximum pressure by the Trump administration, what, what are the virtues of that again, in your opinion? I mean, I don't know in retrospect. I mean, I think that that Trump's strategy was to get the Iranians to come back to the, new, the negotiating table and negotiate a, a stronger deal that he, he believed. Said that. Yeah, he said that all the time. Mm -hmm. And he believed that he had the ability to do that. And, and, you know, I think that Pompeo had the right idea when he laid out the conditions uh, that were much broader than nuclear and included support for terrorism and things like political, you know, their, their, their various prisoners that they had. I mean, all that's great. Um, but that was the, the logic behind it. And the reason it didn't work, in my view, is because he lost re-election and the Democrats came in. And they have been, I, I hate to say, I mean, I'll just say it. The Democratic Party uh, are zombies. They're like in a cult when it comes to the 2015 yeah. nuclear deal. Yeah. They believe it is something that it is not. And they will keep trying it because they just, they, it's not... They're no longer thinking rationally about the deal, which was bad to begin with, right. and even worse now. They they just want any deal because it's a cult, and um, I really believe that it is is kind of this cult. Uh, it's a it's a cult among elite. It's an ideology more it's than an it ideology is exactly, and they and they they can't they can't bring themselves to understand that this moment is that that, that, that there's there's no point in trying to the Iranian, you know, the Iranians, by the way, I mean, it's amazing what happened before Trump got out of the JCPOA, the Mossad, thank God for them, liberated all a warehouse full of schematics and blueprints and plans to build nuclear weapons, yeah. which they had managed to never turn over to the IAEA. I mean, so, <laughs> uh, you know, so all of this sort of proves that it's just a sham. Yeah. So we have to just just give up. I mean, listen, again, all things being equal, if I was, you know, if, if I if I was if I ruled the world and I could just make everything the way I want it, I would have loved to have a deal with the Iranian leaders. And then over time, you know, they reformed and, you know, as they became more integrated in the West. But that was a fantasy that we used to believe in the 1990s. It's no longer true. Yeah. We know it's not true. So let's just give up on it. OK, it's we'd like the world to be a certain way, but it, it, it isn't that way.
Right. So we have to understand that the world has changed and we're no longer interested in that. And that the way that you roll back Iran's nuclear program is through sabotage. And you, Which is what the Israelis are doing. Exactly. Do it through sabotage. If if worse comes to worse, figure out a way. I mean, we but you know, we we I, I don't think it's I don't think it's asking too much to I mean the Iranians are already supporting war all over the Middle East. It's like what else are they gonna do? So right. I and certain, if yeah. if anything, they're 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 using the nuclear program like Putin is using his 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 belligerence um to to try and have an appeasing posture from the West. Yes. So they 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 read the hand of 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 the United States and other Western powers. They it you know you can maybe make the argument even that Iran is the Islamic Republic is not after the bomb. The bomb is a means for extortion and regime survival. The path to a bomb is yeah. probably more valuable to them than actually having the bomb, uh, because they can continue to come to these negotiations, have the legitimacy of being. Uh, seem to be um, actually not even talking to the United States. They won't even allow the United States to, to come to the negotiating table. So these are like little humiliations like Putin has been delivering, for example, when he he, he spoke for many hours with Macron and then turned around and basically yeah. ridiculed him. Um, so where do you see the biggest hope, Eli, looking towards the future, where, where, what do you think are the biggest assets, the biggest sources of hope in, because it sounds like a very long-term uh, war really on these uh, authoritarian regimes? Well, one is, one element of hope, I think, is that, you know, the world is connected now because of the internet in a way that it never had been before. Yeah. So it takes far less time for your average Russian or Chinese to understand that life in their tyranny is far worse and that kind of the world is leaving them behind. Right. And um, I, I would like for there to be as swift a transition to democracy in these places as possible, but we have to prepare for the fact that it may be a generation. Um, I hope it isn't, but I hope I may be generations. I mean, we don't know, yeah. but over time, as we, understand this new strategic posture yeah it'll be very clear to the average russian the average iranian and i'm sure it's already clear by the way to the average iranian that uh their their standard of living is far worse they have less access to technology they have less access to culture they have all of the things that make life easier and worth living and joyful um are available to the west where people want to live and they're not available to them Absolutely. And at, a certain, they know at, it. A, at a certain point, and we have to remember that for every um, IRGC commander has a family and they, you know, they have children and they have that they're affected at as well. It's not as simple as like, well, they, you know, these this is a fan, you know, it's it's very rare that if you really dig down that like the entire family just loves the regime because you know we're in we're one of the elites and we get to live well that might be true for some but it's there's always going to be that kind of tension Absolutely. and so we have to count on that so that's one thing and that's kind of yeah. a, an amorphous thing but the other thing that kind of gives me hope is that um i mean we'll have to see but i i i think boris johnson has been stronger than i thought i would i i wasn't expecting this announcement from the german Chancellor, we'll see if uh, he makes it irreversible. Um, I would like to see more from Emmanuel Macron. I'd like to see more from the Italians. But I think we're beginning to understand that, that, that as, as the threat, as we are watching, this is a demonstration of the threat that Russia poses to Europe. So I would imagine that that will spur Europeans to then give up on their fantasy that they can selectively engage with the Russians. I mean, that's that's over. You know, I mean, the, the the days of people like Federica Mogherini, the former EU foreign policy chief. I mean, she is she needs to go to the dustbin of history. Her approach. <laughs> she's there. I think she's there. Yeah. Yeah. She's she's a disgrace. Um, mm -hmm. And so we you know, we, we, we need a, a kind of, again, a new approach that is focused on excluding, undermining, shunning, censoring, I'm not censoring, sh sanctioning uh, Putin's regime. Yeah. 
you know, and, and ultimately China and Russia, we, China and Iran, again, doesn't, I sort of think maybe just pull the bandaid off that I'm leaning that way, but I could be convinced that, all right, Russia did what it did. And now it's in the special super rogue category and let it be a lesson to the Chinese. And maybe they won't want to do that. Maybe. Uh, but I mean, we should just expect that, that, that China, Russia, and Iran are, are allies that, that that's, you know, that's, that's team scumbag and, and we're, right. we're team freedom. So that's how it goes. Awesome. Okay. On that, on that note, uh, team freedom. Thank you so much, Eli. Oh, wow. Thanks so much for having me. This was a great conversation. All it right. was wonderful. Really an it was honor wonderful. to be here with you. It's wonderful. Thank you so much, everyone for joining us. Thanks again, Eli. Thank you.